This is video four of chapter four. And in this video, we'll talk about Bohr's atomic model. Now, Bohr was a scientist who came up with the first uh, look or arrangement of electrons. So what Bohr said was that electrons can be uh, compared to planets moving around the sun. So his model actually mimicked the solar system model, where the electrons are little planets that move around the central core, which is the sun, at different levels. So very simplistic model, but very believable, very logical model. And, and this came from the discussions that we've seen uh, about emission spectra, about how atoms release light being at different energy levels. Now, in this model, amount of energy separates one level from the other. And the further out you are, in this case, if you're at a higher energy level, uh, or, or if you're further out from the nucleus, as this electron is, you have higher a higher amount of energy. If you're closer to the nucleus, as this one is, you have a lower amount of energy. And there is no such thing as an in-between energy level. In other words, an electron cannot exist right here. This is an impossible orbit for the electron to have. If the electron wants to move up, it will actually just jump from one orbit to the other. If he wants to move down, it'll jump from one orbit to the other. It can never, you know, get lodged and start orbiting in the middle. This is impossible. And this is very similar uh, to how a ladder works. If you want to climb up a ladder, what you do is you have only these rungs or steps to step on. You can't be in the middle of a ladder. So another example is a piano. A piano, you can only use certain notes on the piano. You can't have in-between notes. So this is how the atomic world works. And this is actually very important to understanding uh, the emission spectrum. In this model, then, we can give the number of electrons in a certain energy level. So in the first energy level, two electrons can fit. In the second energy level, eight can fit. In the third, 18. In the fourth, 32. And it just keeps going from there and there, uh, from there on. And to find out how many electrons can fit in a given level, you can use this equation, 2n squared. n would be your energy level, as we'll see. So for example, for energy level 4, if n is 4, then you get 4 squared, which is 8, times 2, which is, I'm sorry, 4 squared is 16. Let's try it again. 4 squared is 16 times 2, which is 32, which gives you this number. I'll uh, adjust my math a little bit. So you can find out how many electrons, say, there are in energy level 18, if you want, even, using this equation. And you'll notice that the higher the energy level, the more electrons can fit into it. And that's because the higher the energy level, the further out from the nucleus we go, and the more space we have to put electrons on. Think of it this way. So let's do an example problem of this. The example asks us to draw the Bohr model for the element silicon. So if you take a look at the periodic table, you'll find that silicon is element number 14, which remember means it has 14 protons, but it also has 14 electrons. So in this case, we don't really care about um, the neutrons and the protons. What we'll do is just we'll say plus 14 will be on the inside of the nucleus. And then we'll draw some energy orbits around the outside. In fact, how many energy orbits will we need? We will actually need three or energy levels, because the first level, remember, holds two electrons. The second level holds eight. The third holds 18. We have a total of 14 electrons that we have to fit, which will require the use of three levels. So the first level has two electrons. So we'll put them on the first orbit. And in this case, I would put the electrons away from each other, not close, because electrons repel one another. They're all negative. So we have two there. That's taken care of. On the second energy level, we'll have eight. So let's go ahead and put them. And I'll put them like this, apart from each other. That's four. And then I'll fill in between five, six, seven, and eight. So this gives us a total of 10 electrons. So, so far, we've got 10 electrons. We can make a little note here, 10 electrons. And we have a total of 14, so there are four more. We need four more electrons. And these four electrons will go on the next energy level, on the next rung. So let's go ahead and draw one more energy level around the outside, and then we'll put four electrons. One, two, three, and four. And this completes the Bohr model. So we only used four of this third energy level. We could, there are spaces available for more electrons, uh, but this is how many we've got. So this would be the Bohr model. Pretty simple, not too bad. 
fact, go ahead and try on your own to draw the Bohr model for the element fluorine. Pause the video. So this is Bohr's model. The more modern model is called the quantum atomic model. So Bohr model is actually the one we just discussed, is a good approximation, a good model, a good example. Uh, but today, we understand the electrons quite a bit differently. Instead of calling them orbits, I'm sorry, instead of uh, call, yeah, calling these orbits, we call these orbitals. So electrons exist in what are called orbitals. And here is what an orbital looks like. Orbits, again, are like planets going around the sun. Orbitals are these three-dimensional, uh, you could say, filled regions where the electron exists. So we're going to take a look at this more modern quantum atomic model. So first, let's define what an orbital is as compared to an orbit. So an orbital is a three-dimensional region around the nucleus where the electron is found. And there are different types of orbitals out there. There's what's called the S orbital, and this letter designates the shape of it, essentially. In a different language in German, it actually represents something about the shape, most likely. And so the uh, S orbital is a sphere, looks like a sphere. So it's essentially a sphere around the nucleus. This right here in the middle is the nucleus. The P orbital, another orbital, looks like an eight-shaped, or like a, a dumbbell shape, oftentimes called. There is a d orbital, an f orbital, different orbitals which have different shapes. So think of the electron as buzzing around inside of this three-dimensional space. Think of the other electron as buzzing around in this three-dimensional shape. If the, similar, if the concept is similar, it still goes around the nucleus, but it's no longer a neat circular orbit like Bohr envisioned. So here is kind of the breakdown, and this may sound a bit strange, a little hard to wrap your head around. Try to follow along and understand. So atoms have different energy levels, also called shells, symbolized by the letter N. So think about this, think about the nucleus being down here, and away from the nucleus, you have these energy levels going up, up, up. And notice they get closer and closer and closer the higher we go. So it represented by N, we'll call these shells. So from now on, we'll refer to energy levels as shells. And you can think of these as three-dimensional regions going away from the nucleus. These shells are then divided into subshells or sublevels. So both of these are synonymous. And these subshells are designated using these letters, the S, the P, the D, the F, the G, H, and then on down the, uh, the uh, alphabet. You'll see that we'll really only use these four subshells. So shell breaks down into subshell, and then each subshell breaks down further. Um, but before we go there, let's make this statement. Each shell has the same number of subshells as the shell number. So if you're in shell number three, then you have three subshells. And because subshells are designated using letters, you have S, P, and D, the first three subshells. The subshells then are further divided into orbitals, and these are the orbitals that we are talking about, and each subshell has a different number of orbitals. The S subshell has one orbital, the P subshell has three orbitals, the D has five, the F has seven, and the G, would you guess, has nine. And it goes on from there. So the subshell is designated as a P subshell, the orbital is also designated as a P orbital, but there's a number of, of these in there. I know this is sounding probably a bit confusing. We'll wrap all this up together, and it'll make more sense. So here, again, is a picture of some orbitals. This here is your S orbital, and there's only one of them, so this is also the S subshell. These are P orbitals. You have three of them, so you have three P orbitals, and together, they make up the P subshell. So that is how this is connected, essentially. The P subshell is made up of three P orbitals. The S subshell is made up of one S orbital. Let's also take a look at uh, the D and the F. There are five D orbitals. Notice how they have pretty strange looking uh, shapes. These look like butterflies, and then this one looks like a disk in the middle with two lobes on top and on bottom. When you put these together, you get yourself the subshell. 
So all these orbitals put together again create this D subshell. So this, this is strange, but this is how the electrons move around the atom in the D uh, subshell. Pretty complex. If we go on and talk about the F orbitals, it only gets stranger. So here we're only showing two F orbitals. This whole thing is actually one of the F orbitals. Remember, there are seven altogether. So just for your sanity's sake, we're going to show you just two of them. So notice it gets stranger and stranger. This, again, is the nucleus in the middle, you can say. And uh, these are how the electrons exist around the nucleus in these F orbitals. This one is even stranger. I don't know what that shape would be called. And uh, you probably shouldn't either. So orbitals then have electrons in them. So here we say that each orbital has a total of two electrons, which means that the S subshell, which has one orbital, has two electrons. The P subshell, which has three orbitals, has six electrons, because each orbital has two. The D subshell, which has five orbitals, two electrons into each orbital, gets us ten electrons total. So these are the number of electrons that fit into each of the subshells, if you count them. And that is about it. Let's summarize all this in this diagram. I know that was a bit, uh, a bit much, but this is actually a good way to summarize the whole thing. So the, in the modern version of the atom, it is broken up into these levels. Shell is the first, then sub, a subshell. The shell is broken up into a subshell. The subshell is broken up into orbitals, and then the electrons are what exist in orbitals. So it's like a four-layer arrangement, you can say. So looking at this, shell one has just one subshell, which has just one orbital, which gets two electrons. Remember that each orbital can hold two electrons. Shell two has two subshells. There was a rule that we said each shell has the same number of subshells as its shell number. That's why that two. And then the S subshell has one orbital. The P subshell has three orbitals for a total of four orbitals. Since each orbital has two electrons, four times two is how we get to eight. Moving on to shell three, we have three subshells. We're adding the D subshell, which has five orbitals. So here we have five and three and one orbitals for a total of nine. Since each orbital again has two electrons, we get 18 electrons total in shell three. And then shell four, which has four subshells, we're adding the F now, which has seven orbitals, two in each plus two in each of these gives a total of 32, if you calculate it. Now, these are how many, how many electrons fit into each energy level. And remember, we started this with Bohr's model by showing you this equation, 2n squared, which told us how many electrons fit into each shell, into each energy level. And you'll notice that in energy level 3, n is 3 squared, which is 9, multiplied by 2 gets us 18. So this ties together Bohr's model and this atomic model. This atomic model is the way we understand it today. And so this is important for you to be able to wrap your head around, even though this is kind of a strange idea. But uh, listen through it again and try this example problem. Go ahead and pause the video. Try this example problem on your own, and we will discuss this further in class. Hopefully you've enjoyed lesson four of chapter four.